Welcome to the Susan Brender Show. It's all about you. Featuring shows on health and wellness, the performing arts, politics, and people who inspire you to be your very best. And now, here's Susan Brender. I'm Susan Brender, and this is the Susan Brender Show. Today, I have a very interesting person on my show, and her name is Diane G. Sandler. Now, she spent the last 50 years of her life and still in the educational world did she do so um, so many amazing things. She received her BA, her MS from Queens College in New York, and administration from St. John's University, also located in New York. Now, since her retirement, she's taken up oil painting, yoga, book club, local political clubs, and is an avid theater goer. I want to welcome to my show, Diane G. Sandler. Susan, it is a pleasure to be on your show, and it is also a pleasure to speak about the passion in my life, education and the arts. I really love these two things, as I think you could get from my um, amazing excitement about being in, with this interview. Well, thank you so much, Diane. But you know, let's let's get in. Let's really talk about all the things that you did when you were a teacher and why. Uh, did you get this passion for the arts? So l- let's start with that. Where did the passion for arts come from? It's very interesting that you ask me that. My grandmother, who lived to be 100 years old and was born and raised in New York, was a very unusual for her t- usual woman for her time. She was actually born in 1894, And she absolutely loved the theater and music. She passed it on to my mom, who actually had a beautiful singing voice and really wanted to be in theater. But in those days, theater was not looked upon as things nice girls did. And so my mom kind of put it aside. However, she always dabbled in theater. She did um, community theater, she sang at weddings, and things like that. And I think that she actually passed the passion to me. Um, I remember as a, as a little girl sitting with my mom and my brother in our living room. We had an old upright piano and singing all the songs of the 40s and 50s. And when I grew up, I think I pass the passion to my two daughters who feel as strongly about it as I do. Mm-hmm. So I think that's where it basically came from. I hear you. Now, l- let's talk a little bit about your grandmother for a min- minute because that was the time that vaudeville was extremely popular with the average person on the street. Yes. And, um, and th- those were very hard times. And so people would go in and they'd probably pay a nickel. <laughs> to, uh, right. to sit in the audience. Now, your grandmother got that kind of taste for the uh, and passion for her music, and she's passed it down. So, let me hear any. Tell me some of the stories about your family and how they all. When you get together, what do you do? Well, unfortunately, I have to say that the talent of playing the piano was not passed on to us. So we don't sit and sing with the piano anymore. However, one of the things that we love to do, and actually my daughters and I try to go to the theater at least once a month. And we make it a girly night, just the three of us, because my husband really is not interested And we go out for a lovely dinner, and then we go to the theater. And what we really like to do is to talk about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about it, um, I I know that, for example, there were so many wonderful shows when I was growing up. I mean, My Fair Lady, um, I mean, in fact, you can give the list to the audience of those shows that you loved. But today, they they just repeat and repeat and repeat the old shows. What, what's wrong with that? You... Um, you know, it's funny that you said that because lately I have been going to the theater and not loving the new shows so much. I still love, as you say, 
my I just recently saw a um a new rendering of South Pacific mm -hmm. which I guess I haven't seen in probably 45 years or whatever. Right. And it was just fabulous. But I think also the joy in it for me is watching my kids who are not that familiar with those shows, but I can I can share it with them. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's true. Now, um, it seems that the people who wrote those shows, um, we're talking about, oh, I mean, so many wonderful, wonderful composers. And um, what is, is it because the system is broken for the arts that you think the people who are writing the shows today are not coming up with such incredible, incredible uh, sh songs and um, stories? You know, it's interesting that you say that because I sometimes think maybe it's the fact that I'm just old-fashioned and that I, I cling to these old um, lyrics and music and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't really know what the answer is, but I think that you might have touched upon something. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that the arts really have been sort of tossed aside, and that's what's said. Yeah. Now, what do you um, what do you attribute to that? Um, because you know, and I'm sure tons of people know, principals and vice principals and all teachers know that the arts really make a difference in children's lives. So why do you think they made cuts to the system? Because I think, unfortunately, the people that are running the system are really not educators. Mm -hmm. They they really the powers that be. Um, I think think that everything depends on reading and math, and certainly, Susan, I would never in a million years say that reading and math are not of utmost importance. They are. But I think that you need to, at least in the United States of America, you need to round out a child's education. And I think that once a child knows reading and math, they need to have the arts, they need to have music, they need to have sports. They need to use their bodies and their minds. And I think that the people that are running the system, at least the people that are running the system in New York that I can see, um, they don't really, they don't value that. Hmm. And it's sad. It, it's very, very sad. And I very often meet with other educators that feel exactly the same way that I do. And I really thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the importance of this in relation to education. Mm -hmm. Now, um, have you ever done research about other countries and what they offer, and are they different than us? Because let me just tell you a story. I remember years ago, I worked with a Japanese population. This was when I graduated my university. I okay. actually taught ESL. And one of the things that I found out about the Japanese is that they love the arts. Yes. And I remember them telling me how they learned all about botanical uh, gardening. I mean, they knew every single flower, everything right. that had to do with the botanicals. And also, they love to sing and they, they love to play the violin. Now, yes. that's one country I know. And also, in China, the same thing. Boy, do they love the arts. So it's very it's interesting that you're saying that because believe it or not, before I retired as a principal, I actually had the opportunity to go to China with a an, with a group of principals. And um the district that I was in in New York City at that time was District 25, and I'm talking about I'm going to say 20 years ago. We fostered the arts. And our district made connections with various cities in China, and they took several groups of principals to China, and we called it sister schools. Hmm. And each one of us was partnered with a school in China. And you are absolutely right. They value the arts. Mm -hmm. They really value the arts. And I think to myself, they value the arts because they know that, for example, studying the violin really improves cognitive development. 
Ah, so explain, um, explain that, Diane, to our audience. When you talk about cognitive development, what does that mean? I think simply it's thinking skills. I, I think the ability to reason, the ability to see things, the ability to critically think out problems. And research has shown that um, children that study, for example, musical instruments, that their cognitive or thinking skills, to put it in a simplified term, uh -huh. um, really do improve. Uh, now, that has to do with the right brain and the left brain, doesn't it? Yes, I think it does, but I'm not really that scientific, so I, I'm not going to say which side. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll let you get away with that. <laughs> no issues. Um, I do believe that it has something to do with the right brain, but that's uh, – we'll, if one of the people in my audience listen to this, um, you might want to write – to sebrender at yahoo.com and, and give us the knowledge that you've got about that issue. So um, let's continue. So now... So wait, I, I just want to share one other thing with you, that after I took the trip to China, two years later I had the opportunity to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. And um, actually the way I had the opportunity was that a friend of mine was teaching at the University of Hiroshima mm -hmm. and wanted me to come and meet with some people in five different cities in Japan. However, he wanted to do this during the school year. And I really didn't know whether I could get away because I was a principal at the time. However, my district, as I said before, they were so um, ahead of, of in thinking about how important the arts were that when I approached my superintendent, she said to me, go with my blessings. And I even said to her, you know, take it from my sick bank. I, I don't expect you to pay me for this. And the district said, no, 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 no. This is an educational experience. It's going to come out, you know, it's going to not come out of your sick bank. So I did visit um, Japan, and I did go to five different cities, and I met with various, uh, I met with the Ministry of Education of um, Kyoto and Tokyo, and I went into Hiroshima, and um, where else was I? I was in um, two other small small places, uh -huh. um, but I did have the opportunity to go in and meet with the principals, speak to them, um, and visit the classrooms. And I saw, just like in China, the importance of the arts that were there the, the, the same way. And I was so happy at the time because, as I said, at that time, we were really involved in the arts here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, but since then, unfortunately, the the budget um, just has been cut so much, and that's what they've thrown out. They've thrown out music, art, physical education, which we certainly know is so important, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's kind of it. Well, you know, Diane, um, it seems that somehow our governments, our political people and people in the educational system don't have – the same values that other people did when you were part of the system. Now, how do you explain that? Because um, teachers like you and even the arts, um, the, the people in dance, the people in music, they, yes. all, they want to work in the schools. They want the jobs. So what do you attribute this to? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. And um, as I said, I, I feel that there needs to be um, more of a forum. I, I think that what happens, unfortunately, I can only speak really about New York because, you know, I, I lived and worked in New York my entire life. Um, for example, the Regents Board in New York State, which is in charge of education, I think maybe out of 17 members, two of them are educators. Oh. So to me, there's something wrong with that. Um, to even take it to a federal level, when President Obama was first inaugurated, he appointed a man to the position of Secretary of Education called Arne Duncan. Mm -hmm. And Arne Duncan apparently had come out of the school system in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited at the time because I thought to myself, 
at long last, they're choosing an educator. Mm -hmm. Um, I I have to say not much has really happened in the eight years in that field. I feel that, unfortunately, it's fallen again into political hands. Ah. And um, this whole idea, for example, of the Common Core, to me, has just been a huge mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I often write letters, you know, to the editor expressing my views. Mm-hmm. Um, very often they're not printed. I, 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 that's why I said to you, I thank you for giving me this opportunity mm-hmm. to speak because I feel that educators really know what children need. Yes. So, so that brings me to another question that, um, from, from, from my perspective, is important. And that is somebody like you who's so interested in the arts and recognizes how the arts affect our kids. If you were to get together with a number of other educators who are maybe retired, wouldn't that do something to the polit- politicians? Because politicians need votes. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I, you know, I, I really, I sometimes think to myself, I wish that I were the kind of person that could kind of stir this up and get a movement started. Um, because you're absolutely right. That's what we need. Educators need in charge of education, not politicians, not business people. Mm-hmm. Um, even in our own city, in New York City, when we had um, Mayor Bloomberg, who was really a wonderful mayor business-wise, um, but a lot of his thoughts about education, in my view, were not correct. Oh. Um, and the whole this whole thing with the Common Core, which was started, I think, about seven or eight years ago, mm-hmm. the initial idea was so wonderful to have a, um, a a system of education that was kind of the same throughout the United States. But what ended up happening was it became a cookie cutter kind of thing. Um, and they, they, you know, every kid, you know, has to do blah, 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 by the end of first grade, by the end of second grade. Mm-hmm. The truth of the matter is some kids can't. Right. Right. And, you know, Diane, in your bio, you say that you witnessed a huge growth in individual self-esteem and self-confidence in many of the youngsters. I want you to explain that to our audience. Okay. When I came into the school where I was a principal, there was no music program and there was no art program. Over a period of six years, I brought in um, a music program for the entire school where kids had um, music appreciation. They learned the recorder in the third grade. They went on to um, play the um, play band instruments in grades four, five, and six. We had a school chorus, which, believe it or not, I used to lead because I loved to sing. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I also took an old, decrepit locker room above the gym, mm-hmm. and together with a wonderful young woman, I converted it into an art room so that the entire school had art. Um, I saw the difference in the behavior. This was kind of a rough school. Mm-hmm. I saw the difference in the behavior of the youngsters in the seven years that I was there. And I can honestly, I attribute it to that. I I attribute it to the fact that um, when I first arrived there, the standard way of handling a situation was to fight. Uh And when I left, the standard way of handling things was to come in to either the the vice principal, uh, the guidance counselor, myself, um, even the secretaries, if the kid needed help in some area where they were having a, an issue and I really I attributed a lot of that to the to the music and art. The other thing that I also saw was that um in the last 2 years before I left we became involved in a program with City Center with social dancing mm. in the 5th grade. And when we initiated the program, needless to say, the boys and girls didn't even want to touch each other. <laughs> You know, when we tried to pair them up, you know, we heard, ooh, ooh. 
Well, it was amazing when you saw these kids do the foxtrot. <laughs> How wonderful is that? Yes. And so now- I, I saw that. And then I'll tell you a third thing. My older daughter is a teacher. She teaches the gifted in a school in New York City as well. And she's been involved with the Disney program for the past five years where they put on a Disney show throughout the school. And I go in as a volunteer to help her. Mm-hmm. I have seen special ed children, um, ESL children who barely speak English. Mm-hmm. By the end of this experience, they're totally different. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you how different they really are and and what you have seen. But before I do that, you just mentioned uh, children dancing together. Now, there was a movie made, and I believe yes. it had something to do with New York. Um, do you remember that? And I, it was I, fabulous, wasn't it? I, yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I had started this program in my school, um, as I said, two years before I retired. And then I think the, the show came out, after, the movie came out after I retired. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I ran to see it. And you're absolutely right. It was, it was filmed in New York, mm-hmm. and it was fabulous. That's right. That's right. Now, I, let's let's talk a little bit about the children who have all kinds of problems. You know, recently, autist, or autistic children are just growing and growing and growing. Yes. We're seeing them. But you know what? Autistic children, when they're when they have the arts in their lives, uh, some of them become like savants. You know, they could sit down at the piano and they just yes. can play any song. So yes. don't you think that the arts also affect kids with different kinds of emotional and physical problems and do very special things for them. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, in this Disney show that I talked about previously, five years ago, there was a, when, when she first got this grant, my daughter, and she started doing this, there was a little Chinese girl who was in the show. She was in kindergarten at the time. And she did not speak a word of English, and she also was part of the special education unit in the building. So apparently she not only was ESL but had other issues as well. Uh Um, I I don't really know what they are. Um, It was not autism, Uh uh, but it definitely, there was something not right. Uh But I saw this child, and I've seen her every single year, because as I said to you, I volunteer with this every single year. This year, she's in the fifth grade, and she's getting ready to graduate. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe this child. Wow. What's so different in her? Well, first of all, when you first saw her, she might have been on the autism spectrum. I, I I'm not a special education teacher, so I can't really define what her issues were. Mm-hmm. But, for example, I remember when I first met her, she didn't talk to anybody. Oh. And it could have been shyness. It could have been ESL. I, You know, I don't know. But now when I come into the school, she comes over to me, Hi, Mrs. Sandler. How are you? Mm. And, you know, just that, I, I think to myself, how lucky that this kid had this. Oh, yeah. No question about it. Now, you also say that the possibilities of children who have all kinds of uh, issues uh, can lead to critical thinking skills uh, and improve their reading and mathematical skills when they're offered the arts. Well, this this is the thing. Being a teacher, I know No two children learn alike. Children are all different. Some of us are great in math. Some of us are great in reading. Some of us can write well. Some of us can sing well. Some of us can draw well. If we take away music and the arts, then those children, for example, maybe they can't think mathematically, but maybe they can draw beautifully. Mm -hmm. And I think that what it does is it it improves their ability to really reach out into various venues, and I think it improves their critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. I also think it improves their self-esteem tremendously. And I think that, um, for example, putting kids on a stage gives them self-confidence, 
Um, both my daughters danced as little girls, mm -hmm. and my older daughter was very, very shy. And I saw what the dancing did to her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she started out in a group class, and after four or five years, she said, Mommy, can I take a solo class? Mm. And, you know, for me to, to see her on the stage alone dancing was something unbelievable to me. So I think it not only improves critical thinking skills, mm -hmm. I think it improves social skills, I think it improves self-esteem, and I just think it makes you a more rounded, learned individual. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we, we've talked all about how the arts play a very big role in the lives of kids. Now, um, you said that you volunteer. Now, let's talk a little bit about that. Because yes. there are so many people out there like you who just kind of think, what am I going to do with the rest of my life if they retire? You know, how am I going to feel purpose? How, how am I going to feel happy? Now, would you suggest to those people to get involved in the arts, in schools, and offer Absolute, their services? Absolutely. First of all, I think that to get involved with children is the best gift that you can give yourself and a child. Hmm. I, I know that having been a teacher and an assistant principal and a principal my whole life, and then actually after I retired from that, I became a college professor, mm -hmm. so I worked with big children. Um, I really, really missed kids. Ah. I missed kids, and I wanted to be involved. So um, to be really honest with you, I, I can't stand the sight of blood, so being a volunteer in a hospital was off limits for me. Um, and the fact that my daughter is a teacher, it made it very, very easy. Her principal was very amenable to me coming in. Um, I did an arts program with her for three or four years. I have volunteered with the Disney shows for five or six years. And um, it not, it's not only wonderful for the kids, it's wonderful for me. Right. I hear you. And, you know, it's a, it's an interesting thing that you mentioned the word hospitals and how that's not for you. But interestingly right. enough, here's what I know. I know that they have arts and medicine programs in the hospitals. Yes. And, and children who have cancer or, unfortunately, other diseases can benefit a great deal from the arts. So um, you know about that? I do know about that. I do know about that. Um, I, to be really honest, working in a, I'm not the, the person to work in a hospital, mm -hmm. you know, or even a hospital setting. Um, I don't know if I could handle it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it scares you a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. But, but I love going into the school and, um, you know, after a while the kids get to know you and to walk into a classroom where you know you're going to do, you know, some kind of an art project with them and when you walk in, the kids stand up and applaud. Oh. What better venue would you want? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, what better? That's a great way to finish our, our interview. What better venue would you want than to work with kids in a school and teach them all the arts? Yes. Now, Diane, I always like to give my guests the last word. So would you tell us what do you think is most important for them to hear? Okay, what I think is most important is that education should become something that is in the hands of educators, not business people and not politicians, because I think that educators know what is best for kids. And I certainly think, just to end everything off, that learning about the arts, participating in the arts, um, just makes you a better human being. Wow. Well, today my guest has been Diane G. Sandler, and she spent the last 50 years of her life in the educational world, and she's got so much advice. Now, Diane, if there was anybody in our audience who would like to get in touch with you, is, is that possible? Sure, I have an email address. Give it out. Okay, it's D as in Diane, G as in girl, S as in Sam, 626 at AOL.com. 
And I would love to hear from anyone that has any suggestions for me or opinions or anything else. Thank you so much. And thank you, Diane G. Sandler. Well, today, as I said, my guest spoke all about the arts and how it's missing in the schools. And she also said that if people want to volunteer and do something that has purpose in their life, that that's a great thing to do. So, audience, listen to that and think about it and do what you can because it would make such a difference in the lives of our kids. I am Susan Brender, and this has been The Susan Brender Show. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Susan Brender Show. To be a guest, email sebrender at yahoo.com.